thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this press briefing on COVID-19 in the region of the Americas. My name is Daniel Epstein from the Department of Communication of Bajo, and this session will last around one hour. As every week, uh, we have received some of your questions via email, and you will be able to ask questions directly uh, and through the chat using the Q&A button. We request you to include your name and medium when you send your questions. Also, let me remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation into English, Portuguese, and French, and Spanish, and you can opt for any one of these languages by clicking on the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen. Today, Dr. Carissa Etienne, director of PAHO, will report on the evolution of the pandemic in the Americas and uh, regarding the situation in Haiti. The, uh, Dr. Etienne is accompanied by Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, Assistant Director of PAHO, Dr. Ciro Ugarte, Director of the Department of Health Emergencies of PAHO, and Dr. Jairo Mendez Rico, Advisor on Emerging uh, uh, Viral Diseases. And now I would like to invite Dr. Etienne to share with us her update on the region today. And good morning, and, and thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, 1.4 million COVID-19 cases and nearly 20,000 deaths were reported in our region. COVID infections are accelerating across North America where routine surveillance has confirmed that the Delta variant has become the dominant strain based on the variant of concern sequences reported over the past month. The United States has seen cases increase by more than a third and Canada by more than half. In Mexico, more than two thirds of states have been deemed at high or critical risk as hospitals fell with COVID patients. COVID cases and deaths are also on the rise in Central America, particularly in Costa Rica and Belize. Meanwhile, most countries in South America are seeing a drop in new cases. Across Brazil, hospital occupancy is lower than 80% across all states for the first time since November. But transmission remains very active. So now is not the time for complacency. COVID infections and deaths are ri rapidly rising across the Caribbean. Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and Cuba continue an increasing trend in both cases and deaths, while in Trinidad and Tobago, weekly deaths continue to rise. In Jamaica, cases rose by 49%, and deaths include by, uh, increased by 70%. We are seeing very steep rises in Dominica, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. The situation in Haiti is especially acute following the weekend's devastating earthquake. PAHO and the international community have activated teams in Haiti to support all aspects of the health response. And we PAHO are fully committed to help Haiti during this very challenging time. Sadly, among the earthquake's thousands of victims was Dr. Usmani Toure, a dedicated PAHO epidemiologist who was supporting our response in Haiti. Our thoughts and condolences go out to his family and loved ones. Dr. Toure's loss is emblematic of the dangers that health workers face and the extraordinary sacrifices that they have made during this pandemic. Unfortunately, tropical storms and heavy rains have added new challenges to Haiti's frontline health workers, complicating the ongoing search and rescue efforts and the delivery of supplies. 
The situation in Haiti and indeed across the region underscores just how critical it is to bring this pandemic under control in the Americas in the shortest time possible. Yet across Latin America and the Caribbean, just one in five people have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And in some countries, fewer than 5% of people have been fully vaccinated. While PAHO is working actively to change this disparity, it will take months until our region has access to the vaccines that it so desperately needs. In the meantime, we must address the many consequences of this lasting crisis. So today I want to take this session to acknowledge just how difficult COVID-19 has been for our mental health and well-being. Throughout the pandemic, stress and fear have invaded our everyday lives. And an unprecedented number of people have lost their jobs and are struggling to support their families. More than 16 months since the virus arrived in our region, we have started to generate data that show the true breadth of COVID's impact on mental health in the Americas. And, Recording and stopped. Let me tell you that the results are grim. Demand Recording for, in progress. Demand for mental health and psychosocial support has never been higher. Yet these services have never been more out of reach. Three fourths of participating countries report partial or complete disruptions in mental health services during the pandemic. More than half of school-based mental health programs and more than three fourths of out of school programs have been partially or entirely disrupted at a time when more than 15% of young people are experiencing depression. And nearly 90% of participating countries report that mental health counseling and psychotherapy services have been disrupted. Yet today, up to 60% of people in our region are suffering from anxiety or depression. These widespread dis disruptions have meant that many people who may be experiencing mental health challenges for the first time, including our frontline health workers who have been operating in crisis mode for more than a year, they all lack the support that they need to adequately manage this, their conditions. And people already living with mental health disorders have struggled to access medications or essential therapies, which can worsen their conditions and leave them vulnerable to crisis. So today we are facing a mental health crisis that if left unaddressed will have severe consequences. It will not only worsen the mental health burden in our region, but also prolong the pandemic's impact. While many countries have deemed mental health a priority and have integrated mental health support within their COVID-19 response plans, few have backed these promises with funding or have put these plans into action. And so that is why we urge countries to please follow through on your promises by investing in mental health programs. A few countries are already doing this well and offer a model for our region to follow. Chile has launched a mental health campaign with the support of its president to strengthen psychosocial services during the pandemic, including by expanding the mental health workforce and offering mental health support to health workers and building up community level care to reach more people closer to home. In a recent survey of health workers in 30 countries, 35% of these health workers said they needed psychological help, but only one third of them had received it. Trinidad and Tobago has also reorganized mental health services 
to bring them directly into communities. It has launched helplines, telehealth services, and online direct directories of mental health professionals to ensure that people can always access the mental health support that they need. Costa Rica is also conducting multiple studies to better understand the mental health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, to better inform their response and to serve as a reference for other countries in the region. To support our member states, PAHO has updated guidance to ensure health workers can meet patients' evolving needs amid ongoing COVID disruptions. And, and we are also working with countries to reduce stigma in our region because everyone who needs mental health support should feel comfortable and safe asking for help. Mental health services are foundational to our COVID-19 response and ultimately to our recovery and rebuilding process. Countries must invest in mental health now to weather the ongoing threat of the pandemic and to limit its ripple effects for years to come. This pandemic is a reminder that good mental health is a linchpin for our region's health and the well being of our societies. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. Um, we have a lot of questions from journalists, and I'm going to start with two that are uh, asking about the same thing, which is vaccination. And I think this would be a question for Dr. Barbosa. It's from Yerson Tollave del Comercio Peru. La voy a leer en español. Que dice que I will read it in Spanish. It reads, the vaccination campaigns are advancing in the countries of the region at different paces before we heard about 70% of vaccinated people to control, to control the pandemic, but now some experts talk about 85%. Also, Alina Dieste asks, what regions and countries are more concerning for Bajo because they are lagging behind in anti-COVID vaccination? So we have those two questions. And in this context, what is the percentage of vaccinated people recommended by Bajo? Is there any uh, estimate of when we will reach this point in the region, Dr. Barbosa, please. Thank you very much for your question. No doubt that there's a great deal of expectation by people to know exactly what is the percentage of vaccine coverage that will be necessary in order to control the pandemic and end transmission. But what happens is that it is a new, a novel uh, virus, so there are new variants. So what we have today are just models. The first models effectively refer to 70% coverage uh, as being perhaps an adequate proportion of the population to be vaccinated in order to reach transmission control. However, there are new models now that talk about 80, 85%, which is an even bigger challenge because we will need to include in the vaccination adolescents and even maybe children. We <clears throat> so far do not have any country who has uh, reached 80% 80 of the population having full vaccination. In other words, the two doses. We don't have any real live data to prove which is that coverage. We know that at least we will need 70, 75, 80% coverage in the population. So this is why we need to continue with our strategies, try to provide all the information to people who can get vaccinated so that they effectively can have access to vaccines, to vaccines, to emphasize the need to have full, full vaccination. In other words, those vaccines that need two doses should get the two doses because this is how we're going to control transmission mission. And those countries that will get to that um, level first, will, we will then know. But we know that many 
countries have achieved 50, 60 percent, this is not enough to control transfer, transmission. We need to complete full vaccination with two doses when required and continue to look for groups that need to be vaccinated to increase this number. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. Uh, thank you. This is very interesting and important. Now we have two questions from Mexico. These are for Dr. Ogarte. One is from Mata Rodriguez from Justicia TV, and the other one is from Melina Ochoa from Uno TV Mexico. And uh, the first question is, um, there is a concern in Mexico, given the increase of transmission and contagion of COVID-19, and in particular, the Delta variant in children who are being hospitalized and even going to the ICU. Why haven't we considered this age group in vaccine protection? And what's the risk of going back to uh, in, in school classes at the end of this month? And are people justified at being alarmed with the uh, contagion in children? And a similar question by Ms. Ochoa is, uh, the uh, federal health secretariat reported that in the next two weeks, there will be a, a decrease in cases of COVID-19. Does PAHO consider that two weeks, uh, there will be enough of a diminished transmission uh, recommending therefore to have children go back to school. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Ugarte. Uh, this is a, a very serious matter for all countries in our region. In the case of Mexico, uh, the uh, transmission of the Delta variant, uh, which is affecting many countries in the world, is affecting Mexico. And the Delta variant represents more than 92% of the circulating variants in the country. This variant of concern is characterized, as we well know, by its a higher transmissibility, and it also affects uh, different age groups, uh, including the younger ones, including uh, adolescents, children, and young adults, in higher proportions than other variants of the virus. The vaccination campaign, campaign in Mexico uh, envisages uh, vaccination to uh, vulnerable populations, to older people, uh, and those living with other comorbidities. However, we understand that they are beginning to discuss vaccination of children uh, between 12 and 18 years of age. So in this uh, um, process, the reopening schools for children to attend, uh, they should base the decision based on the intensity of transmission in the places of where the school is and the place of residence of the children, and also considering the means of transportation to go from school, uh, uh, from house to school and back home. So we cannot just reopen in a generalized way, but it should be based on studying local risks, epidemiological ability, the capacity to respond, and all different conditions in the different um, schools, uh, colleges, universities, etc. So it is important to have efficient mechanisms or improved mechanisms for immediate reporting of symptoms that could appear in uh, educational centers, epidemiological surveillance and quick uh, um, diagnosis uh, to reduce transmission and case, cases appear. We've seen that when uh, children are found or teachers or school staff or college university staff presenting with symptoms, if immediate measures are taken is, um, but only if you have the appropriate infrastructure to detect this infection rapidly. Uh, there are 30 million people in Mexico vaccinated with uh, two vaccines and um, uh, there is uh, uh, an important effort underway in Mexico, and we see that there is a significant decrease in mortality or um, fatalities due to COVID-19. We are far from uh, a level of protection as required to reduce transmission. PAHO and WHO have issued recommendations and documents uh, which give guidelines specifically about school reopenings, 
um, school in person, et cetera. In this, con in this context, PAHO recommends in this process to learn uh, and continue to learn. We should all be updated using masks whenever you cannot maintain physical distance, it is recommended in children over five to be masked. This, of course, leads to broader decision-making, more complex decision-making. To this date, we've seen that with all these recommendations, decisions are always made at local level, and therefore we should continue to check the situation of the students, the teachers, the staff in schools and universities and families where they're planning to reopen schools and universities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ugarte. I see that questions on vaccines continue to flow in and they are all very important. Because we don't have an important question that I think Dr. Etienne could answer which is about the vaccine boosters. It comes from Tanya Smith Cartwright of the Tribune in Nassau, Bahamas. And Tanya asks, does PAHO recommend that regional communities look toward taking the booster shot, which is now being recommended in the United States for all citizens? Dr. Etienne? So let me thank Tanya for this question. Um, each country makes its own decisions about the vaccination strategy it uses, um, considering the availability of vaccines, the transmission of COVID, and other factors. At PAHO, our expert group, along with the WHO SAGE group of experts, have advised that the most urgent priority is to expand vaccinations to all health workers and vulnerable people in our countries. As I alluded to earlier, although we have made some advances in vaccinations against COVID-19, they are not enough. So to date, just over 21% of people in Latin America and the Caribbean have completed their vaccination schedules. This means that we have millions of people who are not yet protected. In some countries, many people have not yet received their second dose of the vaccine, which is critical to ensuring protection. So with respect to the third dose of, uh, uh, or the boosters, we still have no concrete evidence, uh, certainly not for say, from SAGE, to make a recommendation for a third dose. So studies, clinical trials, and data collection are ongoing to gather more evidence in many countries. I can assure you that once that data is analyzed, that um, WHO um, will put forward a recommendation and uh, that will be do done, I hope, in the near future. But if you ask me, our most urgent, most urgent priority is to ensure that all countries have access to vaccines and that no one is left behind in each country. So donations of vaccines, COVAX purchases, and direct purchases by countries have not yet succeeded in getting the Americas the vaccines that we need to reach our eligible population with just the basic coverage. We still have a long way to go to vaccinate our people against COVID-19, and we continue to plead for additional donations of vaccines from those countries that can spare them. And this shortage is why last week we announced that PAHO is offering to our member states a new opportunity to access the COVID-19 vaccines through the PAHO Revolving Fund. And to date, we have received requests for vaccines for both the last three months of 2021 and for the calendar year 2022. So meanwhile, it is crucial that we continue to observe the public health measures including wearing masks, social distancing, adequate ventilation, and avoided crowded and closed spaces, and the other measures to reduce transmission and protect ourselves. These public health measures have proven to be effective. Over. Thank, thank you, Dr. Etienne. Uh, 
we have a question that I think uh, Dr. Barbosa would be able to answer from Guardian Media in Trinidad and Tobago, Kevin Fellmine, on this same theme. Uh, Dr. Barbosa, Kevin Fellmine asks, are there cases of people who have recovered from COVID-19 contracting the disease again? Does recovering from the disease provide any immunity? And do we have any statistics regarding these uh, reinfections with the same strain or with different strains? Okay, thank, thank you for these many, many questions. They are, they are very important. Uh, first, yes, a person can get COVID-19 a second time. This is very well established already. Probably these people are getting a limited, uh, limited protection from the natural infection, and they, they can get uh, uh, the COVID-19 again for the, from the same virus or from a variant, if the a new variant is circulating among the, the, uh, among the community in this country. So yes, it, it is possible. We know that the protection provided by the natural infection is limited. So it's very important, even for people that they had the disease, they need to get the vaccine. Some people, they, they, they share the false information that the people that got the natural infection are better protected than the vaccine. This is not true. So even people that had the disease, they need to get vaccinated. Uh, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't make uh, uh, the, 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 the genome sequencing in each case. So the surveillance is very important. Case by case, what is the variant related to that case? But uh, when we look to the data that we have, it is concerning that with the Delta variant now, we are seeing more cases in people that have already received the vaccines and even people that had the, the, the disease. So it's very important to get vaccinated. The vaccines are working against the new variants. Uh, we need to monitor, to follow up, to have a good surveillance system in place uh, to monitor the, the effectiveness of these vaccines against these new variants. But the best way to be protected against them, to avoid having a new infection or to have a breakthrough uh, infection is to get fully vaccinated. And the, while, we, while there is community transmission, maintain to keep all the protective measures that we know that are effective, wearing masks, avoiding crowded, uh, closed spaces, and other measures that can prevent not only for the original virus, but also for the new variants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Barbosa. And I want to take advantage of the fact that we have Dr. Jairo Mendez here since we're talking about uh, variants and he is our expert on variants. Um, I think what, um, what we would ask Dr. Jairo, Dr. Jairo is, uh, lo hago en español porque así es la, la pregunta. This is in Spanish because this is the question from Nicaragua. Does Pajo have information on the explosion of uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS variants in Nicaragua and in other countries of Central America. Could you update us, Dr. Jairo, on the distribution and the situation of the variants? Thank you very much for this question, which is very important. As part of the technical cooperation that PAHO offers to all of the countries, we have sent the reagents that are necessary for the screening and the study of the strains of concern, of variants of concern, not only to Nicaragua, but to other countries in the region. Right now, we do not have specific, specific information regarding the variants of concern or of interest in Nicaragua, but we know that the Center for Diagnosis has been increasing capacity and we will have we will have information soon and we should mention that due to the effort by Costa Rica Panama Nicaragua and also the cooperation very close cooperation with the regional genomic surveillance network of PAHU it has been possible to show the circulation of various variants of uh, 
concerns such as alpha and gamma and delta in at a lower degree, which are also co-circulating with other variants of interest such as Yoda or Lambda. And according to the information that we have so far from Central America, the Delta variant, which is a, of concern, has only been shown in Costa Rica. However, it has also been officially reported in Panama and Nicaragua, where it has been linked to travelers and we are clearly observing this closely. The sustained genomic surveillance will allow us to also detect this and other variants and also have a closer follow-up for these variants in other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mendez. And now we'd like to ask Dr. Ugarte regarding the situation in Venezuela. Violeta Villar with uh, Web Salud is asking us whether we can offer an update on the vaccination situation in Venezuela, the doses that COVAX has delivered, and also what does PAHO recommend for those that cannot receive second doses due to the lack of supply? Dr. Ugarte. Thank you very much for this question. We do not have detailed and updated information on vaccination in Venezuela. However, this information is usually shared at the internal meetings that the PAHO office has in Venezuela with the government, with the immunization program of that country. To that end, we are also following up the preparations for accepting the first delivery of the vaccines. And our recommendation is that individuals, for those individuals that are not vaccinated, they need to extreme measures that have to do with physical distancing and also to add to what Jairo said earlier and the situation of the variants, it is very important to remember that the public health measures that have been also highlighted and as stated also by Dr. Jarvis and the director have shown to be highly effective to reduce transmission of the virus in all of its variants. So it is highly important to maintain these measures, in particular, the use of uh, masks, the wearing of masks, and also physical distancing, avoiding crowds, and also when symptoms do emerge to isolate suspected cases and to quarantine the cases. These measures have proven to be highly effective, and this is the main recommendation for those individuals that have not been vaccinated and that do not have vaccine supply. But those individuals in which countries there, there are vaccines should make a decision as soon as possible to get vaccinated. It has also been widely shown that more than 95% of the cases at hospitals that are admitted are among people that are unvaccinated. And this is an extremely important piece of information to motivate those individuals that are still concerned or that are still waiting for another opportunity to receive a better vaccine available to get the vaccine that is available because that may be the difference between life and death. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ugarte. And this topic, takes us to a similar question or on a similar topic. And once again, would ask Dr. Jarbas. This is a question by Hannah Lisa Paul and reads. On how PAHO's public education campaign has progressed insofar as it has been able to address vaccine hesitancy. Dr. Barbosa. Thank you for, for this question. Uh, vaccine hesitancy is a very important uh, issue that uh, we need to address during this, uh, all this process that, uh, that we are dealing with so many challenges in this pandemic. 
Since the beginning, we have called the attention to the meanings of health that uh, you, you, you need the vaccine, of course, but uh, you need also many other important initiatives to get a, a good vaccination campaign. You need to train the health workers, you need to establish an assessment about the code chain capacity, you need to establish a very uh, comprehensive communication strategy. You need to, ad to address all the rumors, the conspiracy theories, the false information that are circulating against the vaccine. This is very important. We are working with the ministries of health since the beginning. We had uh, two workshops uh, that, were, that were open to journalists, one in Spanish, one in, England, in English, to clarify all the doubts, to explain how a, a vaccine is produced, what are the standards to assess a vaccine, its quality, its uh, safety, its efficacious, so its efficacy, sorry. So we are working with the means of health. We are identifying some sub-regions in the Americas that the vaccine hesitancy is a, is a, a, a very important problem. This is the situation in the Caribbean. We had a survey with healthcare workers specifically about the vaccine hesitancy, and we are working now with the Ministry of Health uh, in the Caribbean and the, in South America and in Central America uh, also to address this issue. It's very important. This is not a regular vaccination campaign. This is a vaccine that uh, unfortunately has been targeted by anti-vax groups, that have been targeted by people that deny the pandemic, so it's very important to have a very strong and comprehensive communication strategy to provide transparent information to communities, healthcare workers, to, to the families, so they can make the best decision to get the vaccines that can save lives and can control the transmission of the, the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. Uh, we have now a question from Carmen Paun of Politico uh, with a specific- Carmen Paun. Ciro Ugarte can answer. And she asks, uh, what was the status of the COVID vaccination campaign in Haiti before the earthquake? And has it been entirely disrupted by now? Dr. Ugarte? Well, uh, yes, I will begin uh, answering the question and maybe Dr. Jarvas may complement, okay? Uh, I would say that uh, Haiti, after they received the vaccine, uh, all the vaccines were uh, deployed to uh, many vaccination points that were organized uh, in, uh, ahead of the arrival of the vaccine. And although the vaccination at the first, for, during the first uh, days and weeks were very slow, it had uh, uh, increased the vaccination to the population in several areas of Haiti before the earthquake. Clearly, the situation of the earthquake, particularly in the southern areas, but also in the entire country, uh, will be affected because of the logistics, the security, and the humanitarian situation, but also because, uh, understandably, the priority of the health uh, personnel and health authorities is to save lives and reduce the impact of the earthquake in many areas. And also, a lot of healthcare workers are overwhelmed treating trauma patients and the evacuation of patients, but also treating other diseases and trying to reestablish the health services that have been impacted by the, by the earthquake. So in that regards, the vaccination will be impacted, but in the, in the, we will uh, continue supporting the Ministry of Health of Haiti and all other partners, including the private sector, to continue the vaccination and uh, eventually to increase the, the pace so we can vaccinate more people. Because as we know, uh, after the earthquake, uh, many people will not have the, cap the ability to implement all the public health measures and social distancing or physical distancing among others, and uh, will increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19. So, uh, Jarvas, can you complement, please? Yes, thank, thank you, Ciro. Uh, just, just to complement, as, as Ciro mentioned, 
Three weeks ago, Parro deployed 500,000 doses to Haiti. This was a donation made by the U.S. government through COVAX facility. So the vaccines are there. We, we also all support the, the Ministry of Health of Haiti to decentralize these vaccines. Now the, these vaccines are being deployed to 12 uh, provinces in, in Haiti. And the vaccine is, uh, is uh, starting with the healthcare workers. That is the, the priority, the first priority group. And after that, uh, elderly people and people with, the, the, with some underlying health condition that can be a threat, it can be a risk to develop a severe form of COVID-19. Until yesterday, uh, 21,000 people have, uh, have been vaccinated in Haiti. We are working with the Ministry of Health to expedite uh, the process despite all the challenges that the Haiti is facing. Because as, as Ciro mentioned, now uh, in these areas that were affected by the earthquake, we can have people in shelters and people that are dealing with some uh, very, very critical situations. So it's important to, to have the access to the vaccines. We are working with the Ministry of Health and our expectation is that we can increase the pace of vaccination in the next weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. And I know that Haiti is on the minds of everyone at PAHO, in our Port-au-Prince office, in our Dominican Republic office, in our offices through the Caribbean. And Dr. Etienne has been uh, very closely involved in the response to Haiti. So I would like to ask her to answer a question uh, from the New York Times, which is, how is hurricane season expected to impact COVID-19 response in the Caribbean? And how has the storm impacted Haiti and our response? Dr. Etienne? Well, thank you for this question. Of, of course, um, hurricanes and storms uh, interrupt healthcare systems. They affect people's lives, livelihoods, housing. And um, with those disruptions, it is much harder to ensure compliance with public health measures. Um, also in the Caribbean, we do have, as Dr. Javas mentioned, we do have significant vaccine hesitancy. So we, we expect that with disruptive uh, storms and hurricanes, the potential for the increase in cases is very high. Of course, you know that Caribbean countries, um, they, they do have, Caribbean countries do have limitations in terms of their health systems. And, and so if, if in a Caribbean country, you have to deal with the after effects and uh, uh, health effects of a hurricane or a, a storm that causes uh, uh, much uh, impact on people's health in terms of trauma, et cetera, and also some other um, diseases that follow in the wake of, 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 of hurricanes, that places another burden on the healthcare system and, and clearly very quickly uh, would uh, compromise uh, over and overwhelm those systems. So we are very vigilant. Now, in, in terms of Haiti, um, we, we realize that, um, that the, the, the earthquake there has caused significant disruption in lives and livelihoods and um, is also in, um, impacting on the health system to, to merely be able to deliver um, the care that people require now in, in, the, in the light also of tremendous difficulties in moving supplies, in moving um, personnel and uh, et cetera. Um, so this is an added burden um, for, um, for both the people and the government of, of Haiti. And um, we've not been able to deploy sufficient uh, numbers in terms of EMTs, the emergency medical teams. We are working on this, but clearly um, that area of Haiti and Haiti requires um, the assistance and we are helping the government to um, coordinate um, all of those uh, supplies, equipment, emergency management teams. Thank you, over. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Um, 
we have a question that I think Dr. Barbosa would be able to answer, uh, which some people would consider uh, a silly question, but this is kind of the infodemic uh, misinformation that many public health people are faced with frequently. Uh, and this comes from Marcelo Blanco de la Verificadora Bolivia Verifica. Y pregunta, Dr. Barbosa. And he asks, Dr. Barbosa, what is true about those statements that indicate that vaccines are toxic because they have acetone, mercury, uh, and also particles of corpses and also human remains and vegetable remains? What could we say to those individuals that say that those who get vaccinated are suicidal because um, that will damage their bodies. Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, COVID-19 vaccines have been the subject of all sort of uh, misinformation and conspiracy theories. It is not true that the vaccines have any of those substances. The standards for the vaccines are higher than the standards applied to medicines. These are very high standards that are established by experts throughout the world. These are the same standards used by WHO to grant emergency use by the regulatory authorities in all of the countries. So when a, vac when a vaccine needs to be approved first, there is a verification whether the quality of the vaccine manufacturer is at the level required. That is, it is not just any manufacturer that can produce a vaccine. There is a need to make sure that all, there, all of the best manufacturing practices are applied. Then the vaccine safety is analyzed. It goes with preclinical trial, tests on animals, human testing. And with all of that, they verify that the vaccine is safe. And after that, we have more than a billion individuals throughout the world that have been vaccinated. And certainly it is one of the most highly monitored vaccines of the history. And also the vaccine needs to be efficacious. So vaccines are safe. And it is quite the opposite. Those individuals who are getting vaccinated do not have a suicidal behavior, quite the contrary. The unvaccinated individuals are the suicidal ones because they have a risk that is 90% higher than any individual that is vaccinated to develop a serious, a severe form of COVID. So those who could be vaccinated and are not vaccinated are also a threat for those around them that are not vaccinated and that could be developing a severe form of COVID-19. So it is important to share the right information. When we see in social media, well, look at the video that no one wants to share. See what the doctor said, the doctor that is going to unveil the secret just be careful, just be careful with that type of general information. Those are fake news. Look at PAHO's website and look at WHO's website. There you will be able to find information, information that can be verified and also based on the best scientific knowledge we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barbosa. Yes, importante que... It is also important to report on fake news because it is incredible to see what people may believe. So thank you very much for that answer. We are approaching the end of the session. We have a few minutes left, but we see a great deal of interest in Haiti. And we are going to ask Dr. Etienne Haiti from the New York Times and from several other uh, reporters uh, for an update on what is what 
has been the effect of the uh, hurricane in Haiti? And what uh, is it that PAHO is doing? Can you perhaps give us some of the details of our activities there, Dr. Etienne? So let me thank you for your interest in Haiti and, and for your question. So the needs are immense in Haiti right now. People need safe water, they need food, home essentials and other basic goods. Hospitals in Lekai, in Jeremy and in Baradere are overwhelmed and require human resources and emergency support, medicines and supplies. As of August 17th, according to the Haiti Civil Protection Agency, at least 1,941 people died and over 10,000 people were injured, along with heavy damages to more than 12,000 homes. We have trapped victims and overwhelmed hospitals, especially in the department of Guarans, Nip, and Sud. The urgent health needs that were identified by Haiti's Ministry of Health include to mobilize general and specialized medical personnel to the affected zones and to obtain medicines and medical supplies such as anesthetic drugs, orthopedic external fixators and others. They also need logistical support for the delivery of supplies and the transfer of patients. PAHO and the ministry have deployed three teams to the South Department, Sud Department, to conduct rapid assessments of health institutions, to guide the rapid response actions, and to set up information with, um, reporting systems. Our staff is being deployed to the Guan Ans and NIP departments to support re-establishing health services at departmental levels. So in total, 24 health facilities suffered damage, mainly first level of care. In Granans, three health facilities were destroyed and two were damaged. In NIP, we found that one health facility was destroyed and four damaged. And in Sud Department, 14 health facilities have been damaged. Of course, we also want to be able to track any waterborne diseases resulting from water and sewage pipes that were broken, as well as cases of COVID-19. So at this stage at PAHO, our priority is to support the operation of health services and, and to help save people's lives. We are working closely with Haiti's Ministry of Public Health, with their civil protection uh, uh, service and with UN agencies and with other partners to assist Haitians with the vital needs. PAHO has already delivered essential medicines and other medical and surgical supplies to um, the Sud Health Directorate for distribution to health institutions in need, and, and certainly more help is on, on the way. Our country office in Haiti is coordinating the response with help of our office in the Dominican Republic, and the support of PAHO's health emergency team in Washington, Barbados, Colombia, and Panama. The National Unit for Health Emergencies of the Ministry and PAHO are working together in the crisis center in Port-au-Prince. As I mentioned earlier, our hearts go out to the people of Haiti and, and rest assured that we are doing everything possible to assist Haitians in these difficult and hard times. The earthquake aftermath combined with the COVID-19 pandemic presents a very challenging situation for the people of Haiti. So what we need is health personnel, supplies and equipment to treat patients with trauma, injuries, acute illnesses, chronic diseases and mental issues. There is an urgent need to restore health services, mainly in the most affected areas and to ensure adequate water and sanitation to prevent increases of diarrheal, respiratory, and skin diseases. So donations should be geared towards meeting the needs that have been identified by the health authorities and institutions with presence in the affected areas. 
we certainly hope that the international community can come together to help and provide the urgently needed air and ground logistics support to evacuate patients and transport essential humanitarian supplies. And this is needed now. We will continue to support the health authorities on their response to COVID-19 and also the ongoing vaccination campaigns and towards re-establishing health services. But today I also want to make a special appeal to the people of, of, of Haiti. Jodia, map made tout haïtien, tapi, tapi, al vaccine. Pour j'en appeal vaccine qui disponible, tapi, prayo pour protéger tetu, famille, a communauté qui côté wap vive la. Al vaccine. Vaccine, yo, yo sans danger, normalement. Souple, souple. Al vaccine. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. And I think that's probably the first press briefing where we've had uh, Creole spoken, and I hope that many people will understand that. Um, we have reached the end of our press briefing. We want to thank all of our panelists and remind you that you can find more information about COVID-19 on PAHO's web pages, paho.org slash coronavirus. Thank you very much for connecting with us and uh, Sigamos cuidándonos, por favor. Gracias. Thank you for connecting. Thank you. Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.